So here we go. This panel is called Metabolic Flexibility and Longevity. We have an amazing group of panelists here to really dig into what that means, how it can be used to improve health and performance. But before we really dig into the details, uh, the first question that I want to ask to, I guess, the entire panel, and, and, and whoever has the answer first can just start talking. But, you know, metabolic flexibility is a term that's used quite a bit and uh, potentially misunderstood. So can we get a really solid definition of what metabolic flexibility is? All right, so... Uh Metabolic flexibility, you kind of get this bad rap that it's only specific for low carb just because it's talked about in that community a lot. But what metabolic flexibility is, is being able to optimally switch from one fuel source to another. Okay, so throughout different varying levels of intensity, you're going to have periods of time which are glycolytic, which are utilizing carbohydrates, and you'll have periods of time predominantly during endurance work or lower intensity work where you're going through beta oxidation utilizing fats. What metabolic flexibility is, isn't necessarily being good at one or the other, it's how quickly you can switch back and forth between the two. So in the case of CrossFit or in an athlete in general, you're talking about really being able to switch from an endurance mode to a more anaerobic mode quickly and effectively. After today's video, there is a link down below for Thrive Market. Now that is going to get you 30% off your entire grocery order. Okay, so if you are doing paleo, maybe you're doing keto, maybe you're intermittent fasting, you're trying different things out, Wish there were grocery stores that were dedicated for what kind of diet you were doing, right? Well, Thrive Market is like that. You just sort by whatever diet type you're doing and you can shop. It opens up a grocery store for you right there digitally for whatever diet you're doing, which is super cool. But the best part is using that link, you save 30% off your entire grocery order plus a $50 free gift because you're using that link through one of my videos. So check out Thrive Market after today's video to save some cash and get some awesome products. What, what are some nutritional approaches that can be utilized to help you know, athletes, and, and not just high-end athletes, general CrossFit athletes become more fat adapted uh, the, or have a, a, a more efficient way to, to utilize fat as fuel. All right, so at first glance, it's easy to think, okay, well, I'll just train in endurance work and that's gonna condition my body to utilize fats. And to a certain degree, it will, and epigenetically, it does help kind of condition that to happen. But from a nutritional aspect, any time that you are, I'm gonna put it in a very simple colloquial way, encouraging your cells to sort of marinate in either your own fats that are being liberated from your body fat tissue or even dietary fats, you are allowing that adaptation to occur. Okay, so the way that I put it, and I've put it many times, even for Mike and, and, uh, and Chris as well, if you have a railroad track and a train is going down that railroad track, it has a choice to go either left or right when it reaches a fork. To the left is carbohydrates, to the right is fat. Okay, there's that lever, right? And the conductor jumps off and he pulls the lever to adjust the train tracks to go left or right. Okay, well, if you are a one-trick pony and you are always feeding yourself a high-carbohydrate diet to train in that mode, that's fine for if you're continually going on the left railroad track. But then if you need to go to the right, you don't really have the ability to pull that lever because that lever's been so rusted shut going towards the carb mode that that conductor has to like really rip it and pull it to get yourself to utilize fats. Now the converse can actually happen for people that are doing keto and are going really low carb and never adapt to carbohydrates. So it's true for both sides, right? So they get stuck on the right track and they need to pull that lever. The idea is how do I periodically alter my diet so I have periodic modes of either training in a fasted state or a very low carbohydrate state to train in a deficit so you condition for that fat adaptation, but at the same time occasionally train in a carbohydrate fed state so that you put a little bit of WD-40 on that railroad track lever and you can go back and forth a little bit easier. So case in point, occasionally training in a fasted state or doing some of your training fasted is not just for people that are zealots of fasting and low carb. It really is a practical application for that specific style of training. And then try doing maybe a two a day or try training in the afternoon when you're in a fed state to optimize for utilizing a different fuel source. Then you're good at using both. That's a very simple way. And Chris, if you would, you have something that you can add to the board to just kind of solidify this point. So let's do that really quick. I, I, yeah, really, what I want to do is I need you to understand what they're talking about with this metabolic flexibility. And 
maybe in context of intensity. So one of the things that we all talk about in the sport of CrossFit is this constantly varied functional movement, but at high intensity. We realize now over the years that we've got to have a good balance, right? If you're doing high intensity, you got to do low intensity. But what's the purpose of it? And one of the main purposes of low intensity is to build endurance, right? That's one of the main purposes. But really what we're doing is we're looking at where we're getting that energy to move our muscles at this low intensity. So if we, we end up actually moving and we, we talk about the intensity curve where you guys are sitting, all right, and we actually increase intensity to a, a max sprint. This is intensity. If we get to what we call aerobic threshold, which we would call easy pace, aerobic threshold, the reason why we target easy threshold is because what we're developing here is 100% of our slow twitch muscle fibers, these oxidative fibers. But easy pace, there's another benefit to it, and that is where do we get our energy from? And so where we get our energy from, from this easy intensity is 50% of your energy is coming from fat as a fuel. 50% of your energy is coming from carbohydrates. If I keep going at a higher intensity and we get to what we call lactate threshold, which is your maximum sustainable pace, 100% of your energy would be coming from carbohydrates. Meaning as we move into higher levels of intensity, you become more dominant, like what we just heard, on the burning and the consumption of carbs. You essentially become a carb burning machine. What we want to do and what I target on my side is easy pace. Why? Because we're always remaining with contact on utilization of fat as a fuel. If you go faster, now unfortunately, your predominant share of, of energy is coming from carbs. And all you're going to do is you're going to replace those carbs and be right back at square one again. You want to always remain having that ability to utilize fat and fuel. What they're diving into is next level thinking. And that's where I'm excited. I'll actually add to that a little bit because this is cool. I don't even need the marker. I just want to use it just to. So, okay, if this is hypothetically 50% here, if we can get ourselves fat adapted, what if this number could now become 60%? And that's what we're getting at, right? So if you think of fat as sort of being, think of a hybrid car, okay? You have your battery that's running all the time, no matter what, to run certain accessories. Sometimes it's actually running the propulsion of the vehicle. Okay, but then when you actually hammer the gas, sometimes you're not running on the battery anymore, you're shifting and you're getting some gas, right? So, this is the same kind of thing. Your battery is always running. You always have a little bit of that fat that is running to fuel certain things in the body, right? Okay, but then you get to a certain point where this level comes down and you start having more carbohydrates. What becoming fat adapted can essentially do is it can squeak you a little bit more percentage here so that you have more time in your easy zone before you ever have to tap into your hard zone. So if you can be training at 60, 65% of your max and actually still be utilizing fats, you have a heck of a lot more stored energy in the way of fat than you do carbohydrates. So when you're looking at enduring something for hours or days, I would much rather be tapping into something that's going to have 3,500 calories per pound compared to carbohydrates, or nine calories per gram versus four calories per gram. So it gives me a lot more of a buffer to work with, sparing this for when I really need it. Does that make sense? Okay. I'm an athlete. I'm in a CrossFit affiliate. How do I determine how metabolically flexible I am? Do you have a metabolic cart? <laughs> no. <laughs> No. So are there simple ways or is it, is it something that I'd have to go into some testing facility or a labor laboratory to actually uh, get evaluated? If you wanted an exact number and pure data, then yes. Right. The way that I usually, because this ask, question comes up all the time, the way that I usually measure my level of metabolic flexibility is quite simple. And there's no concrete way. It's purely anecdotal. But Anyone that's watching this is probably involved in somewhat of self-experimentation and trying different things out. If you train consistently in a fasted state, just, just for hypothetical purposes here, when you first start training in a deprived, glycogen-depleted, or fasted state, 
you're going to find that your performance probably drops, right? You're going to notice this. And this is perfectly normal. It comes right back to, you know, train low, sleep low stuff. And you're kind of just, you're training in a deficit. And eventually, you will kind of recover and get better. So one of the first things I do is, okay, train in a fasted state until you feel like your performance is within 5% or 10% of where you were prior to training in a fasted state. It shouldn't take that long. And some of this could be psychosomatic, so keep that in mind. Okay. Now, I want you to continue doing this for as long as you feel comfortable doing this. And if you're a competitive athlete, it can be difficult because that's time away training for maximum wattage and maximum intensity, and I understand that. But then I want you to try training with carbohydrates prior to working out after doing that for a period of time. If you notice that you actually feel worse, then that means it's time to actually introduce carbohydrates back in again, right? Okay, if you notice that, wow, I feel really good fasted, and then when I have carbohydrates, it's just like I feel really, really good. That's a good determining factor that, okay, maybe you're, in a very colloquial sense, a little bit more fat adapted, where you're able to use those fats better, and then when carbs are sprinkled into the mix, you're feeling like you can utilize those too. Now, I mean, full disclaimer, that is a very anecdotal, loose way of putting it, but that's, as an athlete, how I kind of determine where I stand metabolically with what fuel I'm using. Last question, then we'll open up to the crowd. So here are a few ways that we can determine whether we are metabolically flexible or not. Kind of going down the panel here, can you give your best piece of advice to the CrossFitters out here to improve their metabolic flexibility? Just one. So it could be nutrition, it could be exercise, whatever it is, but you get to choose one. That was beautifully said. And I like that she mentioned the lipotoxicity piece because that is such a big piece because it's, it's very important, so I'm glad you mentioned that. Like, if fats accumulate in the blood, that becomes the problem. If you're insulin resistant, you're not utilizing the glucose well, but if you're not good at using fats, then guess what? Then you just have glucose and fat pooling up in the blood, so that's an important piece. As far as, especially with training is concerned, words of wisdom, periodize your nutrition just like you would periodize your training, okay? People say, I found a nutrition that works for me. Okay, that's cool. That's like saying, I found a workout that works great for me and I never change it up. You have to condition your body. You have to periodize your nutrition too. So that means train under all aspects of nutrition. Train at high intensity under low carb. Train at high intensity under high carb. Train at low intensity under high carb. Train at low intensity under low carb. And just mix it up and constantly be demanding a lot from your body under different nutritional modalities and different deficits and different surpluses so your body is, for lack of a better term, adaptive. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Let's open up some questions to the crowd. Uh, there we go. Uh, thank, thank you guys for being here. This is a pretty awesome class. I, I came in, came in kind of late, but I was just curious. With uh, metabolic flexibility, how does that relate or does it help as far as hormone production, hormone regulation for both men and women, specifically estrogen and testosterone? Does that improve anything as far as, far as those markers go or that, that capability? I'll take a stab at it. Um, I think just the, the surface level understanding of that is, you know, anytime your body is adequately fueled, which it is not in the case of someone that's metabolically inflexible, uh, you know, you, you obviously can improve things like that. Uh, hormones are a very, very complicated piece with tons of moving pieces that it would be unprofessional for me to say that that would fix it. But kind of at the baseline level, I mean, if you're improperly fueled and you're metabolically and mitochondrially dysfunctional, that is usually a precursor to all of those things that start to fall down the line that you see as far as, you know, menopause, as far as low T, all those things, they do tend to stack up. And if you look at the data, they do tend to stack up after some mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, that's the safest explanation I could give. So many of us are not CrossFit Games athletes, um, and we're not trying to coach CrossFit Games athletes, right? We're trying to make normal people fitter and move the needle a bit. And so I, I think there's a lot of what uh, we've talked about today that, you know, do a month of, you know, fasted in the morning, then add back carbs, things like that may be more difficult for normal people that have normal jobs or, you know, shift work. I'm a physician as well. Uh, going to work, you know, brain dead doesn't really work for me in the morning. Um, so what, what should we be telling our athletes, our patients about kind of how to do this, you know, in a, in a practical day-to-day -day sense for 
you know, your normal person? Listen, I work with firefighters. You know the number one killer in a firefighter? Heart attack. They're not elite athletes at all. And you know what the prescription is? Go out and move and focus on an easy intensity. If you're not fit, enjoy not being fit. Slow down and just focus on time. I will echo that and I will say that the foundation is almost always going to be that easy intensity and everything that we've talked about here. Yes, there's hacks and little tweaks you can do nutritionally, but you know what's going to maximize autophagy more than fasting? 30 minutes of aerobic activity. You know what's going to maximize fat adaptation? Aerobic activity. So increasing mitochondrial density and getting more of those energy powerhouses is going to be what allows everyone, obese, non-obese, muscular, not muscular, to live a better life and have a better health span. So, and I think what I have seen in my short time really being associated with CrossFit in the last year or so, there's a lot of focus on that max intensity, on just wanting to go and go and go and get in in 20 minutes and get it done. And that's what is so just endearing and so exciting about it is I can get this done. But we're lacking the aerobic volume that we really need. And it's not the sexy thing to talk about, to say go for a walk or go for a slight jog. But learn to love it because it's going to be the best thing for you. Hi. Um, so I started CrossFit about eight years ago. And about two years ago, I was in the best shape of my life. Um, hit menopause. Um, knee injury, back injury. So what I'm hearing is I need to do aerobic exercise, but I can't run anymore. So what I've found is it's been really challenging to try and keep the weight off. It's just been gaining and gaining. I eat clean. I train every day almost. Um, what do you recommend for somebody like me? Would I be, would I be better off trying to do keto for now? Or... I'm trying everything. Like I've tried the balance of carbs and fats and what have you. I, I, I don't know what to do. Although I can't directly speak to the hormonal situation, I will tell you that a good number of people simply respond well when they're put in a box. And sometimes, like for me, because I was about 300 pounds 10 years ago, for me, I lost 110 pounds and keto was the answer for me. And the reason that it worked for me was it put me in a box and it forces you to eat whole foods, it forces you to eat energy dense foods that are satiating. Now, not everyone feels the same way about keto, and that's totally fine. But I think it's worth putting a valiant effort into it just because there is some evidence surrounding menopause, surrounding PCOS, surrounding these things, and it's pretty good evidence. Um, so I think it's worth a shot, but from the very least, it might give you that mental reprieve that you need to at least just because when you're trying to balance these fats and carbs, this is a very nuancy, almost advanced discussion in some ways. It's simple fundamentally, but when you get down to the practicalities of it, you're like, you're telling me to eat carbs win, fats win, this is mind boggling. Sometimes what you need is just put me in a damn box, forget it, and let's go. And so, then would you recommend that for a period of time and then to slowly reintroduce carbs or? What I usually suggest to people is give it 90 days because that first two weeks to a month, especially if you're an athlete, you probably will notice like a little decline in performance. You will notice throughout that adaptation. And you have to be willing to accept that, right? Because that adaptation comes at a cost. It doesn't just, if keto worked so well for people the first week, don't you think everyone would be doing it? It's just, it, it comes with a price and it's difficult and you have to get through that. And it's so difficult for people with an athlete mindset because they have to be willing to accept a short-term decline in what they've been used to conditioning themselves with for so long. So I usually say, you know, if after 90 days you're really not feeling better with it, then, you know, reevaluate. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for coming out here and listening to this. Please give it up for the panelists. Thank you.